This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, so they come to you. Let's do a Hollywood production in Hawaii only, about a, a mysterious island with at least 16 major characters and polar bears. What yeah. was your initial reaction? Um, how's the polar bear going to work? <laughs> Which it didn't. Um, <laughs> well, the way, I, the way I came to it was I was doing a sh uh, alias. Uh, for J.J. Abrams, and uh, th he uh, went off and did this crazy pilot island show called Lost, and it actually was the dream child of Lloyd Braun, who was the head of drama at ABC, and one lesson for all of us in this room is everybody at ABC said no to Lloyd's idea when he was laying on a beach in Hawaii and looking up at palm trees, and he had this vision of this show about a plane crash on an island, and it was kind of, it was during the, the monster hit of Survivor, the beginning of Survivor, and he was thinking about all that, and he came up with this idea that no one, none of his colleagues liked, and he kept pushing it, and had the tenacity to get a pilot made, or written. The first draft wasn't good, and then he went to J.J., who was doing Alias at ABC, and said, will you conceive, help us figure this out, which J.J. did. And then they made the pilot, and then cut to uh, months later when J.J. said, we've got this pilot, and it's going on the air. Once again, no one at ABC wanted to put it on the air. They didn't know what to do with the show, and they thought, maybe we'll make four TV movies out of it, because who's going to watch this thing, they thought. So uh, JJ called me and said, there's no one I would rather have run the show in Hawaii creatively than you. Would you watch it? And uh, I said, sure. And I watched it, his amazing pilot, which was remarkable, had no budget, because no matter, I mean, how much it costs, they put it on the screen and it looks it. And uh, I'm watching the pilot with my wife and my two daughters at the time, I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to do this every week? <laughs> I'm going to be known as the guy who blew this great pilot because how do you do this every week on a show? And when it was over, I was, wow, that's amazing. And they went, you're going to Hawaii. And I said, well, wait a minute. Maybe I'm going to Hawaii. I'm not sure. And I was very tentative about it. And then I met with Damon Lindelof, and we had conversations about let's make the show keep the scope make it as much about the monster inside these characters as the monster outside these characters. So from the beginning, the, the, the formula was let's make it about the people, but also give it the cinematic scope of a great big movie. That's the long and short of how I, then from s episode one all the way through, I was there. So now we, we jumped to Walkabout, which we just screened tonight. Right. Uh, you know, amazing. Never seeing in the theater is a totally different experience uh, that I've ever had, because I've seen it several times. But right. Amazing with a full house. Uh, but you really don't know yet what's going on with the show. The characters mm -hmm. are still kind of, you know, you're still fleshing them out and emerging. So how did you approach, you know, directing this script? You know, is it really the first lock script? Well, there were a lot of, s first of all, episode two, which was after the, after the pilot, was really like many episode twos of many shows, kind of just continues the ball forward from the pilot and the world that's been established in the pilot, and you improve whatever things need improving, and you continue it. Uh, many shows, episode twos, uh, the second episodes are difficult, as was ours. Although, you know, the audience hung in there and we pulled it off, but when we did episode three, which was Walkabout, that's when we found the show. Um, Damon Lindelof uh, found it in the conceiving 
of that episode, which was Locke can't walk when he gets to the island and suddenly he can walk. And there were people in the writer's room around him who said, if you do that in the first episode, this show's over. It can't be an island that cures people. And he said, well, it may or may not be that, but I know Locke cannot walk. And Damon <laughs> stuck to his creative gonads, and <laughs> they went that way. My challenge directorially, how many of you are directing in here? Want to direct? You're cinema students, a lot of you, hey, right? You got okay, one, two, well, whatever. Three, yeah. Okay, the challenge was, how do we tell a story and never see the wheelchair in the flashbacks? and never miss seeing the wheelchair. That was one of the tricks of the show. So I decided, well, let's not do any camera moves. No dollies, no movement, no floating camera. Keep it very stark and much more Sidney Lumet as a filmmaker, much more all the great 70s Alan Pakula filmmakers. Look at The Godfather. There are not many camera moves in Coppola's Godfather. You know, Gordon Willis, the way he shot it, it's very very static and beautiful and composed with light and movement, but within the frame. So in any case, so I said, okay, in Locke's world, which is a box company, so thematically, this stark, beige, boring world, let's keep it very stark and only have, I said, no plants on the set, no vegetation. Mm. There aren't any. I said, let's keep it very beige and very boring and very stark and do it just with cuts. And in every shot, we avoid the wheelchair till he's in the travel agency at the end. Um, on the island, I said, let's keep it, obviously, the two major colors on the island were blue because of the ocean, that gorgeous turquoise, and sky, and green because of the jungle. So let's keep green and blue out of our flashbacks as an idea, and let's keep a lot of fluidity and movement and big wide shots and camera moving on the island to make the difference in those two worlds. And that kind of became the language of our show for a long time uh, in terms of let's keep camera moves out of the flashbacks, and then eventually rules change. You get to an episode that's got to have more romance in it, and suddenly the director of that particular episode said to me, gee, maybe we should do a camera move here. And I went, you're right. OK, mm -hmm. let's do it. But that was part of the visual language of the show. And um, there was one, uh, the scene where Locke wakes up on the beach. Uh, and I used uh, some of the shots from the pilot that were brilliant. Um, thank you, JJ. And then we <laughs> continued it the smoke and the camera movement and all that stuff to shoot all of Locke waking up and the shots with his feet in the foreground and all that stuff. But there was so much noise when we were shooting because of the big wind machines mm -hmm. that were creating the jet that was still blowing air and sucking air in. And there was so much chaos in the frame, we had these big ridders, these big fans that make a lot of noise. So I'm way back there at the cameras and <laughs> I'm yelling to Terry O'Quinn as he's standing up <laughs> and he's acting the hell out of it. And I'm screaming at him. Um, I said, more vulnerable, <laughs> more vulnerable. And he goes, what? More vulnerable. <laughs> And afterwards, at dinner one night, he pointed out how absurd that was <laughs> to be screaming at the actor those words, more vulnerable. But Terry <laughs> O'Quinn is such a genius, he did it. Um, so in any case, that was Walkabout and the challenge of it. And uh, one other thing directorially, we had, and the, the David Fury, who wrote the script and got name, nominated for an Emmy for it, flipped out in Los Angeles. He was in Los Angeles and saw the dailies because what was written was Locke walks in after that scene where Jack is following what he thinks is his father, and uh, which brought in that supernatural element to the show. And uh, Locke was supposed to walk in with the boar over his shoulders, the dead boar. Well, because of the ecological issues in Hawaii, we and half our crew had killed a boar that morning, that morning because they all hunt boar and then they 
cook the boar, and that's part of the life on the island. So we were talking to one of the crew guys about, can you bring in one of the boar that you've killed in the, sure, we'll bring in the boar. Well, the Humane Society said, no, you can't photograph a dead boar, but the boar is dead and he just killed it yesterday. Couldn't do it. So we had to get a prop stuffy boar <laughs> that was shipped over from LA. And the minute Terry O'Quinn put it on his shoulder, <laughs> it looks so ridiculous <laughs> that I said, well, we may as well not even do this episode. It's so ridiculous. So I had him pull it in. And if you notice in the cut, we don't cut to it. We cut to Terry coming through <laughs> and yanking this heavy thing that we assume is going to be a bore. And then we cut to it at one bloody moment where it's not embarrassing. And David Fury <laughs> was really furious at me, uh, but ended up feeling pretty good about the episode. Uh, at this time now, I'm assuming you were thinking about Locke was emerging as he was going to be a leader, one of the, like with Jack. Yeah. So that shot to me that really symbolized it, you have the chaos of they're starving, Jack and Sawyer arguing, the camera's all over the place, and then you lock in directly on a lock who throws a knife at Sawyer, mm -hmm. and it's like, we hunt. Him. Yeah. Did that for you really set, this is John Locke? Yes, and directorially, that helped me find the language of the show, because directorially, as you say, the chaos of that scene is it's unraveling excuse me, is hitting the fan, and people are panicking, and Hurley says there's not enough food. So there's panic within the ranks, and Sawyer sits down and says, well, what do you propose? And suddenly this knife, <laughs> whack, hits him, and there are two shots. You know, it goes by him, and we had a knife on a wire, and all those wonderful things you can do in movies. And it was my idea to have him throw it, to have her, uh, Sawyer sitting in a chair, because what was written, what Damon and Carlton, no, David Fury wrote, Damon wrote, but <laughs> we won't go there, um, <laughs> he, that he was next to a tree and hit a tree. Right. And I said, let's use one of our airline chairs, because keeping the plane alive and the wreckage was really important the first season. So the knife cuts through, bang, from that point on, the handheld camera stops, and boom, it goes very static. And then we do that dolly move in on Locke, who's now taking control of the tribe, and he becomes the parent. He becomes the stable one. So I had the camera also get stable, um, which actually was a good idea, I think, if I do say so. And um, it really set up the conflict yeah. with Jack. Yes. I mean, Locke oh, yeah. and Jack's throughout the whole entire yeah. series sure. were battling. Yeah. Uh, one of my other favorite shots this episode was, because we're going to talk about some of the other ones, but getting back to a little comic relief with Hurley. Yeah. You established Hurley and Charlie's friendship. Right. Did you always, did you, at first, did you think we can use Hurley as comic relief, or did you have at that time, you know, we're going to take Hurley, I'd see Hurley maybe going to where he actually finished with the show. I think that um, Jorge is so awesome at subtle comedy. And he's so subtle. And I think in six years, he laughed at two of my jokes. And I'm pretty funny. <laughs> um, he's a really pain in the butt, tough audience. And, uh, but Jorge was so good at throwaway comedy and his character from the pilot on where he's going, dude, you know, he was so iconic from the beginning that clearly the guys wrote to that and eventually had to write to in subsequent seasons the fact that everybody on this island was kind of losing weight except Hurley. <laughs> so they came up with some brilliant stuff about him stashing Dharma, you know, Caesar salad dressing <laughs> and stuff like that. But Jorge's just brilliant and can play drama and comedy, but definitely they wrote to his human side. And also human comedy is very important in a show that's dramatic. Every good show has humor, The Sopranos. David Chase used to laugh a lot when he'd watch episodes of The Sopranos and cut them because he thought they were just so twisted and funny, <laughs> you know. And in some ways, they were. My other favorite shot is when the monster, we yeah. don't know the smoke monster, charges that lock. That one? Yeah. So how that did you? Was tough. How did you do? Because at this point, do you even know what the monster is? Yeah. No. So how did you? How did you? How do you get an actor like? There's a monster. I don't yeah. know what it is. Yeah. And you're not afraid of it. Right. How do you direct that? <laughs> well, it, it was tricky, and I was worried that I hadn't pulled that off because it, I was worried it was going to be like a bad horror film shot, you know? 
um, the, the point of view of the monster coming through. I knew that we'd be okay. Kevin Blank was our visual effects guy, CGI at that point, and would take down trees and do all that stuff CGI, even, even though we did blow up some at times and pull some down that we were allowed to do. Um, and we had wind machines blowing the trees, and I knew Terry would be great reacting to what's coming, what's coming in the anticipation of it. But I was really worried about how I was going to do that monster approaching him, which we didn't know what it was. So it wasn't as if you could have furry arms, which would have been really cheesy, you know, coming at him, or smoky arms. And later on in the series, some of those smoke monster shots, we used to call it the sock puppet, you know, <laughs> we were in our finest moments. Um, nevertheless, I just came up with that crane shot that would move in past the trees and kind of come on to him from very high as if it was the monster's point of view. And Terry just was able to pull off the believability of I'm horrified, but this is the Sistine Chapel. Somehow I'm seeing something that's so beautiful and so horrific, I never thought I'd would. And, and let's, it's yeah, all his acting. If you, you miss that shot, it could really ruin the show. Because yeah. it really did establish Locke's love of the island. We yes, all understand why he right. loves the island. That's right. But if that was a cheesy shot or yeah, Terry oh, didn't pull off, yeah. it could have set the show. Yeah. And uh, Steve Semmel cut the show and did a beautiful job. Uh, but you also had some great scenes where were very confining, like when he's talking to Helen mm. on the phone. That must have been difficult, too, because you have the actor who has to be in bed, can't move. Yeah, script supervisor read the lines to him. Right. He had to be in bed, and I had to have his legs positioned that could be like any of us in the room sitting on your bed at night, that, but not indicating that the legs were not moving or they were in a position that was all uncomfortable. Um, so, and, and we did that in very few shots. It was a wide shot and tighter, and I didn't do it with a lot of camera movement. Once again, I wanted his world to be stark, you know, and, and then Helen eventually, you know, got played by a wonderful actress down the road. Yeah. So let's jump to the season finale about the stark contrast. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things about Exodus, which we just watched, is the different places they're in the island versus, you know, yes. the real. Michael and Walter are each other's throat in the flashback yes. and sleeping side by side. Right. Sawyer is being aggressive, being called, you're no good to anybody or comment, but right. he's actually saving the day right. with the thing, right. and, you know, and other people. So how did you approach that, where the, each character was a completely opposite? Well, there was the a, same, well, first of all, there was, that was the first time, I think, in the finale, we did everybody's flashback in one episode. Otherwise, it was just one character. And, uh, and that was part of the brilliant notion of the finale, that it would be everybody and tell something about those characters. And I felt like, depending on where the characters were, what the nature of the scene was, the locations, and where they were in their story would dictate how visually to approach them. And as far as the actors, it was just, they were all wonderful actors, and they listened to me, and I listened to them. and. Uh, like a good director-actor relationship, and I think they all pulled it off beautifully. Yeah, and for some reason, my uh, I have a few women that work for me, students, and they seem to like the Sawyer Lumberjack scene. <laughs> they wouldn't tell me why, but they asked me to ask you about it. No, for me, dramatically, it is the first moment. Mm -hmm. Sawyer's always, you know he's kind of deep down a good guy, but when he actually does a completely selfless thing That's for right. a person he doesn't like. That's right. Uh, so is that for you the turning point for Sawyer, where yeah. now he's suddenly, you know, yes. he's a good guy? Yes, and you notice I had him put on his shirt at that point. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, in fact, I told Matt Fox I was going to do them both without their shirts, <laughs> which would have been hilarious and cheesy. <laughs> Just these two men talking to each other with their no shirts and, and you know, oil on their skin so the, they'd look, you know, um, like the rock. Uh, in any case, I, I thought Josh did a beautiful job. The writing of that scene was great, but that was his first selfless act, and I think the way Mac, Matt reacted to it was so subtle, and how he couldn't face him and turned away, and it's, it's a wonderful scene, and, and that starts with the script. But it's also, it was interesting because it's all, it's all of his nonverbal dialogue, yeah. which is you. Like Matthew Fox says very little, mm -hmm. and even Sawyer is always trying to use as little words as possible. Yes. And is. so is that something where how do you get, the, how do you work He's with not, them together? Well, Sawyer isn't verbose. Well, we, you know, we talk, we talk enough about the subtext of the scene and 
what's under the words and what the scene's about. And, and for the most part, good actors have a sense of that instinctively. There were some times during the making of Lost where I would have to tell a character, like we did a scene <clears throat> toward, uh, it was in season six, I think that if I'm not mistaken, was in the premiere of season six, where we went back to the airplane where Matthew was talking to Scotty, to um, uh, 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 Scotty Caldwell, um, oh, Caldwell, who was, what was her name? Rose, Rose, Rose thank sorry. you, jeez. Too many shows since then, it's <laughs> like names. But um, he was, he's talking to Rose and he says something to Rose that continues from the pilot where he says something to her, we made it. And it's after the horrible turbulence in the premiere. And Matt and I had a lengthy discussion about how that was gonna play even though Matthew had an idea where the series was going to end, um, he and I talked about how that scene would echo in the final episode of the series, and that that line meant more than just we made it through turbulence. And um, I told both of them, and they played it subtly and beautifully. Um, and even another great nonverbal moment, because Shannon mm -hmm. uh, that has been a difficult person right. up to now and you and again nonverbal when Walt gives her the dog the talk goes boon I mean and I thought I was like that was my favorite Shannon scene yeah. throughout the whole series she was um, she Maggie was wonderful in that scene I sound so hearts and flowers but it is like looking back on family and uh, we all loved each other and got furious at each other through those six years every one of us but um, Maggie was terrific in that scene and so subtle and wasn't used to that kind of gesture, her character. And I do have to say that Vince swimming out to the raft was something that happened on the set. It wasn't written. And being a dog lover, <laughs> yeah, there are other dog lovers in the audience. <laughs> and I will, I will, and Damon and Carlton, I give credit to, constantly for their genius work and their scripts. But that was a moment where I was on the set and we were doing the scene. And by the way, no one knew our production designer, Stephen Storr, designed this raft and no one really knew if it was seaworthy. So, <laughs> I mean, we didn't really know. The Hawaiian guys gave us all the things we needed, like outrigger th stuff. And, but nobody really knew that thing would sail away. And when it did, the crew behind the actors was going crazy <laughs> with me too. So um, it was brilliantly designed by Stephen. But we, um, we were on the set and I was thinking when the, I said, and I went up to our dog trainer, this woman, and Vincent was, <clears throat> excuse me, not a brilliantly trained dog. <laughs> Vincent wasn't Lassie. Um, <laughs> and in most scenes is looking off when people are petting him because he's looking at the trainer, <laughs> the quote unquote trainers, which trained dogs really aren't supposed to do. So in any case, Vincent, I said, tell me Vincent, because we had done a whole season with Vincent and it was usually tough going. I said, tell me he's not the only lab in the world that doesn't like to swim. <laughs> and she said to me, well, oh, Vincent will swim. And I said, will Vincent swim after the raft? And she said, if I'm on the raft, and I said, go get on the raft. <laughs> and we shot it toward the water first, and Vincent, God bless him, came chasing after the raft and the camera, and she said, and she said go back, Vincent, go back, go back, go back. And Vincent turned around and swam back, oh, be still my heart. <laughs> I. Uh, yeah, so I was very proud of that. And when Damon and Carlton saw it, they went, oh my God, it's so great. And uh, I don't know that Carlton was a dog person, but <laughs> he got it anyway. And one of the other <laughs> things, I want to talk a little about this, uh, the music mm -hmm. of that scene was amazing. Of course, the whole series, Michael you know. was, was, you know, every character Michael has their own Jake, music. You know. How yeah. did that, work, having that kind of guy with music adding to your... Well, JJ, I for, think, started working with Michael, who's a genius also who's now doing nothing, but he's, I think he's doing J.J. Star Wars like he did Star Trek, and he does 
so much. He's just brilliant and couldn't be a nicer man. And I had in the original cut used James Taylor's The River is Wide, which probably most of you don't know, but maybe some of you have heard of James Taylor, okay? <laughs> but this is an old song that is exquisite. And I put it in the cut and everybody loved it, but they said, let's let Chiquino take a crack at it. And oh my God, when we saw it on the dubbing stage, it was like a massive feature film emotionally. And that theme he developed, which he brought in, I think, during the sun and gin scene. Mm. Um, and that too is a beautiful scene, but Yun Jin would always get mad at Daniel because Daniel, when he took the part, and Daniel, sorry, um, <laughs> whom I, who's great, but uh, Daniel, I think said he spoke pretty fluent Korean. It wasn't exactly true. <laughs> um, and we would get a lot of actors on the show who would come to do scenes with Daniel and would say they spoke Korean and we'd end up having them, we'd have to put the Korean phonetic words on <laughs> Daniel's shirt <laughs> to let an actor who was supposed to, who was Korean but didn't speak Korean but we were now in Hawaii and we'd flown this person over, have to read it off his shirt and act with him speaking Korean. So there were a number of issues about that language and sometimes Yun Jin would get mad that eventually Damon and Carlton would cut the show and the exact, for the emotion in a scene. So the exact proper phonetically correct Korean phrasing would sometime really embarrass Yun Jin, who uh, is a big movie star in Korea. And everybody said, what? You know, it's like saying a sentence that isn't quite a sentence, but the line says it's a sentence, you know, so that's another story. <laughs> uh, so a very important question that's on everybody's yeah. mind. It has nothing to do with me thinking she's my favorite character and awesome. Uh, what was it like developing Kate with Evangeline Lilly? Um, Evangeline Lilly <clears throat> is remarkable. She came, first of all, loves to climb trees. She's <laughs> climbing that tree. You know, I said, you just have to climb up to here. And she said, no, I'm going up it. She loved it. She climbed the hill when in the episode season one where Sawyer and she jump off the waterfall. And she's quite amazing. Um, but she hadn't acted before. She had done one commercial. She was a model. Uh, who did print work in Canada because uh, to help put her through school. And she didn't really ever really want to act. And her acting agents, her modeling agents, one this particular season said, look, why don't you read for some pilots? She said, what are pilots? <laughs> they explained, okay, yeah, I'll read for some, what the heck. So she reads for, because all the pilots cast in LA, Chicago, New York, Vancouver, Toronto. So she's in Vancouver reading for four different pilots, which she gets put on tape. Nobody in LA was seeing anybody that they thought was right or special enough for Kate. And JJ had a remarkable eye for finding, you know, remarkable women. You know, he didn't know he was going to make Felicity until Carrie walked through the door. You know, and he's had that experience with Jennifer Garner on Alias. So he's got a great eye for casting women and uh, in particular roles. So um, Evangeline reads for the part, doesn't hear anything. Her agent calls her and it's at the 11th hour in immigration. We needed to get paid. They needed to get papers and all this stuff. So they call Evangeline and I think she went down to LA to read and to test in person, which she did. She goes back to Vancouver and uh, the agent calls her a week later and says, oh my God, you got, you got lost. And she goes, which one was lost? <laughs> and they go, you know, the airplane crash. And she said, I got the crazy airline crash <laughs> island show. <laughs> That's the one I got. And they went, are you serious that you got anyone you've never acted before? Are you out of your mind? And that's how remarkably fresh and in some ways naive 
and badass she was and is because she came to Hawaii and uh, inhabited that role. And during the first season, there were a lot of times where I would hold her hand and we would talk about how to play a moment. One in particular, the first episode where she's driving away from the farmer mm. and um, the detective, the FBI guy that we see in Exodus is following her and she's on the run. And she was doing a scene where she's driving with the farmer who befriended her and she's got this emotional relationship with him and he's saying something to her. I forget what it was, but she had to say, she had to play the emotion of something he's telling her or she's saying to him. And then at a certain point, look in the rear view mirror and, she, and see that she's being chased by the FBI guy. And yet she had to then continue the scene and not let him know and play the emotion mm -hmm. to the driver. Okay, so now she's got to play two, thing, which is, two things, which is the emotion of who she's relating to, and now suddenly I'm being chased. Holy shit, what am I going to do? But I can't let him know, and I've still got to continue the relationship with him until I, you know, let the cat out of the bag. And she did a take that was good, but it wasn't great yet where she was playing the emotion, that was terrific, and she looks up to the rearview mirror in one minute and has a reaction that's nervous and then goes back to him and kind of drops the tension of what she just saw and is now just playing into the emotion again. So I go up to her, and we were on an insert car. I go up to her and I say, listen, that was great. All the emotion is there with the farmer. I said, in the moment you saw the car behind you, that was great. But then, and she stopped me and she said, I dropped the tension, didn't I? And I went, yeah. She said, okay, I'll do it better. <laughs> the next take was great. And that's somebody who's just born with this crazy ability to act. And uh, that's who Evangeline is. She's great. And if you remember, if I remember seeing this at Burma Mark before a walkabout, that's what we talk about block. If you blew that scene, Kate, we right. never had sympathy for Kate because she actually right. goes back to save him yes, and goes back Risk to goes him. to that's prison. Right. And if you miss that, that's right. Kate is ruined, actually. That's yeah, right. So. Right. That was part of her humanity. Yeah. So it was a fascinating experience to work with someone. I'd, I've had a number of experiences uh, working with people who have never acted, and but Evangeline is born to it. Uh, jumping a little ahead, and we're going to open up some questions soon. Uh, season two, The yeah. Hatch. Yeah. So what were your, you have a confined space. Right. You're told you have to paint a mural. Right. <laughs> from a psychotic crazy man. Yeah. So what were your challenges like when you went for the second season of that? Well, match? everybody, um, the network was incredibly, now that we were this massive worldwide hit, the network was suddenly all over what our show was and what it was going to be. And everybody was paranoid that suddenly this massively beautiful cinematic island and ocean show was going to now be down in a hatch. <laughs> so the production designer, um, Jim Sheridan, I believe, did a brilliant job designing the hatch. And the first concept was that it was going to be run down and crappy, right? And then the network wanted to see pictures of it, which we sent back. And they said, no, it's too down. It's going to be depressing. They were worried about loss suddenly becoming grim. So we, we walked a fine line to f try to find the balance of what that place would look like. And the hatch painting, which I painted, um, I'm a painter also, and we came up with this idea that Desmond would have gone crazy. And so there was some paint around, and he painted part of the story on the wall. And, uh, and the day I painted it, I knew some of what the where the story was going to go that season. I knew there was a ship. I knew we were going to find Ottawali, who is this crazy drug lord, priest, dude, and the plane that was going to come in. I said, OK, I'm going to paint some of those images in my crude, childlike way. And I had my assistant at the time, who wasn't Ryan, who's here, who was my assistant all of season six. So anybody who didn't like the finale, it's his fault. <laughs> uh, but um, the, um, so I was, I said, go get, you know, five colors of paint 
and uh, I painted the hatch painting. And there was a moment where I, there was some purple paint, and I don't usually love painting with purple, but I went, I just grabbed it and did with the tube six concentric circles that are in the picture, and just because I wanted to. And it ended up when the hatch painting was dissected in Time Magazine and Entertainment <laughs> Weekly, it was supposedly symbolizing the reverberations from the lost city of Atlantis, those six concentric circles, when in fact, those six concentric circles were a tube of purple paint and me going, oh, I'll make some circles, <laughs> which was part of what was wonderful about doing something like Lost because there were times we didn't know if it was riding us or we were riding it. And getting ahead to a uh, third season, there were two arcs that I've always been curious about. Uh, you have the whole arc of Charlie's fate built from the, you know, the beginning of the season to the end. And of course, the reveal of Jacking is in a different place. Right. You know, the, the season finale, which is my favorite oh. episode. How did you approach that? Because you had to keep the secret where you were going. Uh, and Charlie, dramatically, to me, was the most dramatic moment, I thought, in Lost, the third season finale. Um, thank you. It was, um, well, there were so many technical things. And I don't know if you guys are interested in this, so I won't go through how we shot in a pool, the hatch filling with water, and all, just all that stuff that happened. Um, uh, but saying goodbye to Charlie was a big deal. And there were a lot of conversations about, we knew that we had to keep survival a central issue on our show, which meant that some of our beloved characters had to die. Um, Charlie, at that point, was the most beloved who had died who was going to die. And there was a lot of conversation between all of us who it was going to be at the end of the season, who was going to be sacrificed. And it ended up because of Charlie's storyline, being a drug addict. Mm. And, you know, writers, the beginning of every season, when you're doing a really creative show, and in those days we were doing 24 episodes. So you have 24 chapters to tell a story that starts here and ends there. And the writers start off going, okay, like here's the ski lodge, here's the top of the mountain, here's the ski lodge when we're done. And along the way, there are all these flags we're gonna ski around, right? And this is gonna happen, and this is gonna happen, and a light is gonna go on on the hatch, and this is gonna, and then what the writers do is when they are, because it's such a creative medium, it's not like a movie that's 110 minutes and that screenplay, even though it can be very improvisational and rediscovered in editing, great films do that all the time. When you've got that many chapters of the book you're writing, you can follow them down different little weird alleys. And that happened a lot on Lost. And, uh, but they felt at the end of the day that Charlie's character, because of the drugs and everything, that they had written themselves into a corner and that he was the one that was gonna be the most emotional to let go of. And, and how was it on set with Desmond and Charlie at that moment, it was, directing that scene? Yeah, it was rough. And uh, it was not easy, and Dom was wonderful. In fact, yeah, there's so many stories, and, and it was Dom's idea to cross himself, which oh. was gorgeous because, you know, his character started off as somebody in his past who was very religious before he became a rocker. And uh, that was Dom's idea, which was exquisite. And uh, I got credit for it, and I told everybody, no, it was Dom, <laughs> which I'm very pleased to do. Um, but it was, it was, and not Penny's boat. Mm. Not Penny's boat. That, I was in Paris with my wife, and we were walking, and these three guys are coming toward us, and they've got a black T-shirt with <laughs> white, <laughs> not Penny's boat on. <laughs> and I went up to them and went, ah, and I didn't speak French, and they didn't speak English, <laughs> but they thought I was a Lost fan. But, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but, it, you know, it's, I, I remember doing a speech about saying goodbye to Dom, and it was not easy. It was not easy. And speaking of emotional, uh, jumping to the four seas and the constant, which one of the fan favorites, yeah. Uh, I was going to show that tonight, but I, I don't know why I didn't. <laughs> that was that. What, what's your question? Because that well, was, well, I just like because yeah. that was also you did. It's a different thing. You're not doing flashbacks mm. per se. Totally different directing style. Right, right. And at the end, you have to have the most dramatic moment right. with a phone call across time. And again, if you blow it, 
it falls apart. Well, I've got a couple of good stories about that. Um, the constant was a real challenge, not because of the acting, but because of how we were going to tell the story visually. And early on, I decided that we didn't want to do cheesy flashback looking things. We wanted to put our characters in the real world. So we didn't want the film to be monochromatic. We didn't want the film to be washed out. We didn't want, you know, the subtlety of walkabout was, okay, let's just subliminally make sure that it's a stark black and white cardboard kind of world, but not anything the audience would see because directorially, I really believe, I don't believe in style over content for me as a director, I believe style and content really should come together in a, in a great way. You know, you, you're gonna make a horror movie look different than you are the way we were or something, but whatever. Okay, um, I'm dating myself with the way we were. <laughs> but um, with the constant, we decided that we came up with this idea that I would use certain things to get us in and out of time. And we juxtaposed some scenes in the script so that I could do that. For instance, when he's in the helicopter and he's panicked and he grabs the seat, right? I'll cut to the seat, him holding it. And then we cut from him in his bed in the army barracks holding the side of the bed. It's almost, and, and the camera would accentuate that so that the idea would be that the character is really overlapping the experience in both time zones also. That was one of the keys to how I was going to pull it off stylistically. <clears throat> that final scene between Penny and Desmond was beautifully performed by both of them. And our editor uh, cut it the way it is in the picture in his first cut because the editor will cut the movie and show it to me. I'll work on it, then I'll show it to Damon and Carlton. They'll work on it, they'll show it to me again, and we go back and forth, and the show gets finally cut. But Mark, the editor, that was his first cut of that phone call. And all that building, sort of like the end of Sergeant Pepper, A Day in the Life, that cacophony that built was all his doing. And I didn't see it that way when I directed it. And Damon and Carlton didn't write it that way. And Mark Goldman cut it that way. And we went, oh my God, it's genius. And when the network saw it, they were worried that the audience might not understand the flashbacks. Mm. So they wanted some visual blur or blend when we would go to flashbacks. And we argued them out of it. Damon and Carlton and I just went, no, trust the, sh trust the movie, trust the storytelling. The audience will get it if we do it in an honest way. We don't need to cheese it up with, you know, <laughs> a little dissolve or some kind of tricky camera move or a swish or anything like that. And we, we did it like that. And, you know, in television, I've really learned that there's not a great show on television today or any of the great shows of the past 50, 20 years even that somebody hasn't fought for what they believe the vision of the show and also listened when the other people are right because they are lots of times. You hear notes from network and other people that are really great, but that was a perfect example of fighting to keep it a certain way and we were right at the end of the day. And jumping to the finale, what was the most uh, difficult uh, reunion or most exciting for reunion to shoot? Well, the reunion of the characters. Well, Dom, God love him, came back, and I didn't really understand what he was saying to me. He said to me, see this bottle? And I said, yeah, it was a vodka bottle. He said, it's water, but I'm going to use it. And I went, but it's not real. I said, OK. So when we were doing all those concert scenes, he was, Dom is like the biggest John Lennon, may he rest in peace, fanatic. He's got Strawberry Fields tattooed on his arm <laughs> um, or something like that. But Dom was performing on the stage 
when he's supposed to lose it and then go back when Claire walks out, when he first sees Claire, makes contact. And uh, there were a number of things personally on the show with relationships that were on again, off again, whatever. That's neither here nor there, but it only charged it more. But Dom was acting like an out of control, pain in the butt, drunk rock star on stage. And he wouldn't do what I wanted, and he wouldn't play the moments, okay, I want you, and he took his guitar at one point and threw it down, and I had the microphone, and I just was, it was late at night, and I was annoyed, and I said, God damn it, Dom, just do what I'm telling you, just God effing stand there, and oh, the man's talking to me, screw the man, and, <laughs> and I'm going, oh my God, just goddamn do it, and it went on and on, and I totally forgot at that moment what he was up to. But even if I had remembered, it would have still been a pain. <laughs> and we got through the scene, and it ended up being great. And the next day, we hugged each other and totally understood where each of us was at. Um, and there was a, I really never, everybody asked me in the press, Are, do you feel an incredible pressure directing the finale of Lost? And I said, and I really didn't, because the way I live and the way I work is just putting one foot in front of each other. And if you screw up and you trip, then you do better the next day. And my wife, who's a rabbi, helps me think that way. You know, every day we get up, we do the best we can and try to do better. And so there I am directing it. And the moment it really hit me was when I was doing the scene with Jack and his father in the church, where they reunite, which was such a magnificent scene. And Matt and and John, right? John, right? Come on, Ryan, John, the father. Don't. Okay, you can cut this part out. <laughs> He's a brilliant actor. Um, God, too many names. <laughs> but he, um, they were doing the scene, and I really suddenly felt the weight of directing the finale and just going, okay, just don't blow it, just keep everyone on track and just keep doing it. And then the next day we did the reunion in the church. And the way I shot that, now all these actors, a lot of them hadn't been on the island since they were either killed off or left the show. So literally it was a party in the church. And for the first three hours, I just said to everybody, talk to who you want to talk to, hug who you want to hug, and the ca our camera operators just walked around with handheld cameras mm -hmm. and recorded the party, which a lot of, and, and at one point I said to Jorge, pick Matt up, you know, <laughs> just walking around, and he picks up Matt, and it was this joyous, emotional reunion, which is the wonderful conceit of what death is, which was what our finale was. They weren't dead all the time. It was about how these people lived their lives, who they lived them with, and who the most important people were to them, and then how they saw them and, and how we live and how we die. So it was a, a, a finale that, that scene was quite emotional and wonderful to shoot. And it was, uh, the finale itself really wasn't Ryan's fault. Um, Ryan was there every step of the way, but I will say that there are two, uh, th two quick things, if we're winding up, I want to mention. When I knew how the series was going to end, but I didn't know, like those flags on the slalom course, I didn't know every beat by beat how we were going to get there. And Damon, we were in London doing press before the finale. Before, no, before the season started. And Damon and I went to Abbey Road and walked across the street, and went to Abbey Road Studios. We had a great day, then went to the Tate Modern. Then we were walking back to the hotel and he says, okay, I'm gonna tell you the story of the, the end of Lost, the last season. So during the walk from the Tate back to the hotel, which was about 45 minutes, he told me beat by beat exactly what this season was going to be. And we, this is really true and I have the photograph to prove it. We get to John Locke, and Damon says to me, okay, this is John Locke, and he starts telling me what's happening to John Locke, and I glance up, and I go, Damon, stop, and he goes, what? 
and I point up, and we are under a pub called The Walkabout. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> the Walkabout. And he goes, oh, my God. And I went, oh, my God is right. So I go, I got to take a picture of you under this. So I take a picture of, da of Damon under the Walkabout sign, and then I, he says, I'll take one of you. He takes a picture <laughs> of me, and in the background, there's a man in a wheelchair wheeling away. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Scouts on it. <laughs> oh. So that was really one of those moments where is Lost riding us or are we riding Lost? <laughs> we don't get it. Um, but it's those wonderful things that happen like that in life and in work. But the other thing I was going to say was um, how proud I was of the finale, even though a lot of fans expected it to be more of a Marvel ending. You know, the CIA. The fo red phone rings and someone <laughs> picks it up and goes, no, they found the island. You know, bomb it, do this, do that, bang, cut to black. But we didn't do that. You know, we, we told the story of how these people live their lives. And I think that was a beautiful thing. Yeah, I love the moment actually with Ben looking up at Hurley when Hurley says, I want you as my guy. Oh, my God. Uh, that was like Mike Lamerson's best, yes. one of my favorite moments of his. Oh, my God. It, it just like finally getting recognized. And, yes. Uh, you know Michael Emerson was only scheduled to do three episodes. Did he tell you right. that when he was? Yeah, and then the, uh, the, the milk scene. Yeah, the milk, <laughs> the milk scene. scene. That's right. Got milk? Got any milk? So you knew he was awesome. Like you saw it, like we have to make him. No, what happened was Michael Emerson came to the island. He's this New York actor who had done brilliant work already in television and movies. And he's playing three episodes as this guy, the others, leader or whatever. Yeah, and um, we're working with him. And the first day this New York actor gets to the set, he's shooting in the jungle, hung upside down in a rope in front of a tree with a net and a knife thrown at him. And that was his first day on our set. And he went, well, it's a little different than SVU, you know, which he'd done a lot of. And uh, it was Damon and Carlton when they saw the dailies of when he said to Desmond, you got any milk? When he was eating his cake or cookies. <laughs> and they said, this guy's a genius. We have to keep writing for him. And then he became who he became in the right. show. Well, I mean, this is the close of the evening. Uh, please join us in the, obviously, reception. I want to thank, thank the Pollock you. Theater interns. They are my constant. They make this uh, all possible. And of course, thank you, Jack Bender, for sharing your insights thank and you. bringing us back to the island. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for being, thank you for being fans. It means a lot. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that was great. Thank you. Oh.